Okay, so here they're saying that an electrochemical cell has two half cell reactions as this. Okay, so these are your two reactions and their respective potentials given to you. Calculate the value of each cell. Okay, so let's look at the reactions. The first reaction that you have is Y3 plus plus electron is giving you Y. Okay, and the potential here is given to you as 0.22 volts. What is happening here? You have Y3 plus going to Y0. Okay, which means what plus 3 to 0 is reduction. So this is basically your reduction process. Okay, then you have a second one where you have Z becoming Z3 plus plus electron. Okay, which is from 0 to plus 3. This is going to be oxidation. Okay, and what you have here is 2.27 volts. Okay, so this is the potential given to you for oxidation, right? Cool. Now, what do we know? We know that E cell, E cell is nothing but E cathode minus E anode. Okay, but cathode and anode are not mentioned here. So, how do we find out what is cathode, what is anode? There is a small trick that I have for you. Remember this, okay? Red cat and ox. What does it mean? It means Red is reduction, okay. Cat is cathode. Similarly, you have this. This is an, okay. This is an anode and OX is nothing but oxidation, okay. So, anywhere that you need to apply this, reduction happens at cathode and oxidation happens at anode. Now from here, check where is reduction happening. Reduction is, uh, reduction is happening here, which means this is your cathode, okay? And oxidation is happening here, so this becomes your anode, okay? But be very careful because for the oxidation part of the reaction, oxidation part of the electrochemical cell, they have given you oxidation potential, not the reduction potential. So while calculating, you need to take the negative of this. Okay, that is what you need to keep in mind. Now let's calculate E cell. So your E cell will become E cathode, which is 0.22 minus E anode minus 2.27. Okay, which is nothing but 2.49 volts. Okay, 2.49 volts is here in option B. So option B 2.49 volts is going to be the right answer to this question. So here they're saying, arrange the orbitals in the increasing order of their energy. What are the orbitals given to you? You have 3px, 2s, 4dxy, 3s, 4pz, 3py and 4s. Okay, cool. So how do you arrange these things in order of their energy? By common sense? Okay, by now it might seem like common sense. But what is the fundamental idea of, you know, assigning a comparative energy value to certain sub, uh, certain orbitals. You basically have to look at their n plus l value, okay? So you have to find out the n plus l value and if you get the same n plus l value, okay? If it is different, then you already know. If it is same, if it is same, then you compare the n value and wherever you have lower n, lower value of principal quantum number, lower value of your shell number, that orbital will have a lower energy. Okay, let's get started. Okay, so here you have 3px, that's the first thing. Uh, so here you have n is equal to 3, l is equal to what? So for your p subshell, what is the value of l? It's going to be 1, right? So n plus l here is going to be 4. Then what do you have? You have 2s. Okay, one second. Yeah, you have 2s here. So for 2s, your n is equal to 2 and your l is equal to 0. So your n plus l value is coming out to be 4. I'm going to highlight this in boxes so we can, at the end of it, just compare. Sorry, this is going to be 2, right? Not 4. Okay, this is 2 and yes. Then what do we have? We have 4dxy. Okay, 4dxy. Okay, so n is equal to 4 because 4 is written. What about D? What about for D subshell? What is the value of L? It's going to be 2, right? Okay, so L here is 2. So N plus L is going to be 6. Sorry, this is 6. 
and this is inside a box. Cool. Then what do we have? We have 3s, right? We have 3s. So for 3s, 3s, we have n is equal to 3 and l is equal to 0. So n plus l is going to be 3 here, right? So this is going to be 3. Okay. Then we have 4pz. Okay. 4pz and we have 3py okay i'm very lazy i don't keep you know want to keep going back there so we have 3py here now here n is equal to 4 l is equal to 1 here n is equal to 3 l is equal to 1 n plus l is 5 here n plus l is 4 here great so you have this and you have this lastly you have 4s okay i'm just going to fit 4s here so for 4s, your n is equal to 4, l is equal to 0, which means your n plus l is going to be equal to 4 and this is what you have. Now, which uh, subshell has the maximum energy? Where is the n plus l value maximum? Here, right? So 4dxy is going to be the one with maximum energy. So we'll write the order here. You have 4dxy. This is maximum followed by 4pz followed by what okay now for 4 now for energy level uh, sorry for n plus l value 4 you have three orbitals tied you have 3px you have 3py and you have 4s so what do we know if your n plus l value is same that the one then the one with the lower n is going to have lower energy okay which means here 4s will have higher energy followed by now between 3px and 3py how do we decide this they have the same n they have the same l n plus l value is also same then what do we do then we know that they are degenerate orbitals right because they are all a part of the p subshell so they are degenerate orbitals they have the same energy so you will write 3p x is equal to 3py and then you have your 3s and then you have your 2s okay now let's look for that here maximum we said was 4 d x y this was maximum followed by 4 p z okay look here in all the options they've just given equal 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 okay we know that this is greater that is what we have suggested um here as well correct so just by that you can eliminate all the other options option d is going to be it but let's check for the full order that we've already written we have 4 p z then we have 4 s then we have um 3 p x is equal to 3 p y and then this is greater than 3s, this is greater than 2s, okay? And that's exactly the order that's mentioned in option D. So option D is going to be the correct answer to this question. Okay, so here in this question, they're saying, which of the following properties of water can be used to explain the spherical shape of rain droplets? Okay, so first of all, you need to be very clear that raindrops are spherical in nature, not this teardrop kind of shape that you you know you've normally seen and you know from our childhood we draw raindrops as a droplet shape in fact that's why it's called a drop shape right but raindrops are roughly spherical okay they're, i mean they're more spherical than their teardrop shaped so what property is responsible for you know a raindrop being spherical in nature or you know spherical in shape what do you think is responsible See, so basically what happens is first thing you need to know that a raindrop is very small, right? The size of it is very small. Okay, the radius is small. And when you are talking about such a small radius, there are two competing factors there. First is your surface tension. Okay, and second is your ambient air pressure. Okay, or what is happening is you are, you have such a small object where, you know, viscosity, sorry, your surface tension is acting from the inside and your pressure or your drag is acting from the outside. Okay, so between these two competing factors, always, always surface tension is the one that is going to win on such a small scale because of which surface tension is going to, you know, go ahead and try to make a spherical shape out of the raindrop. Okay, so spherical shape is by virtue of a phenomenon that we call surface tension. And that is your an option B. So option B, surface tension is going to be the right answer to this question. 
Okay, so here they are asking standard electrode potential of which of the following electrode is taken to be zero by convention. Okay, now this is something you either know or you don't and since this is the first time you're studying, it's okay to not know, don't get too worked up. So standard electrode potential, we take it, uh, you know, as zero for the hydrogen electrode. Okay, so hydrogen electrode is going to be the answer here. The reference of, you know, whatever we measure, you know, as you know, plus or minus is always with respect to hydrogen. Okay, you need to understand that all these E0 values that you see are comparative and what are they compared to? They are compared to hydrogen. Potential, standard potential for hydrogen is going to be zero. Okay, so option A, hydrogen is going to be the right answer to this question. Okay, so here they're asking you, which of the following is correct about potassium permanganate? That is your KMNO4. Okay, we have been, you know, this is one compound that has been stuck you know right from the first chapter redox inorganic everywhere you will see this compound it's, it's like it's almost a favorite compound within chemistry let alone you know leave some examinations within chemistry this is a favorite compound okay let's see so here you have option a strong oxidizing agent definitely kmno4 is a good oxidizing agent it's a strong oxidizing agent and it shows oxidizing nature in your three different media that's your basic alkaline and neutral medium you will see different oxidizing nature but it is one of those uh, very few oxidizing agents that can give you oxidizing action in all three media this is definitely true then option b is a deeply colored self redox indicator is it deeply colored Yes, you know, it has that characteristic deep purple color. When you make a, a, a solution of it, that solution itself is also going to be a dark violet color, deep purple, violet, whatever you want to call it. It's got that slight pinkish violet tint, okay? Self-redox indicator. So yes, potassium permanganate is one of those things which is a self-indicator, okay? So the moment you talk about using potassium permanganate as uh, you know, a titrant in a reaction, what happens is the moment you encounter the end point, the point of equivalence, you will be able to see it because you will see a change in color due to the presence of potassium permanganate itself. You will not need to add any external indicator. What is an external indicator? Something like phenolphthalein, methyl orange, methyl blue, uh, bromothymol blue. Okay, bromothymol green. All of these are your external indicators which you need to add such that you can see where is the end point of the reaction. When you encounter the end point or the point of equivalence, you will see a color change in that particular, in that particular, uh, you know, flask or whatever it is where you're adding the uh, indicator. However, with KMNO4, you don't need to add anything because it will itself show you the end point by showing you a change in color. So yes, this statement is true. Option C says color disappears when titrated against a reducing agent. So yes, what happens when you titrate KMNO4 against a reducing agent? Your MNO4 minus, right? Your permanganate ion, which is responsible for that, uh, you know, deep purple color, that gets reduced. Okay, that gets reduced to different things depending on the medium. Depending on the medium, it would get reduced to MN2+, 4+, plus, 3+, plus, plus, anything. Okay, so because of that, because of that, yes, the color change is observed. Yes, the color disappears when you titrate it against a reducing agent. This statement is also true. What do we have? Option D, all of the above. Yes, all of them are true about potassium permanganate. So option D, all of the above is going to be the right answer to this question.